I want to talk to you today about truck accidents. At our firm at Shannon Law Group, a number of people come to us after a very catastrophic situation has happened to them. Either them or their family members have been hit by a commercial truck. Now, these are very prevalent things that happen. In fact, over the last 10 years, truck crashes are up nearly 50%. Let me give you a statistic. Nearly 6,000 people were killed in 2021 in truck crashes. Let's compare that. In the last 10 years, there's been a total of two people killed in commercial airline crashes and nearly 6,000 in one year alone in 2021. If this type of thing was happening in the airline industry, there will be all sorts of action by the government and agencies, etc. However, this type of accident happens all the time on American roadways. Now, why do these crashes happen? These are very important questions to be asked. Most of the time, your average person believes that there's a number of smaller reasons why these things happen. Either bad weather, poor judgment, texting while driving, other distracted driving, uh, malfunction of the truck, driver error, driver bad judgment, all these things contribute to have a truck crash. Now, mind you, 5,700 or 5,800 deaths in 2021 out of 57 or 5,800 crashes, that meant for every big truck crash like this, somebody died. So in some of the, the cases, multiple people died in the truck crash. But most of the time, 70 some percent of the time, it's the occupant of the vehicle hit by the truck that is the one that's got the, the injury or the fatality. When somebody comes to us after a truck crash or a truck accident, the, the case starts right then and there. We get our investigation team on it right away because we know that the crash occurred for a number of different reasons, but there are other reasons that went into it as well that only a proper investigation will uncover. One of the number one things, the number one things that causes these truck crashes is that the driver is improperly trained. The trucking company in its haste to get a truck driver on the roadway to move its goods or to move a client's goods does not have time to properly train the driver. Let's just say they have the time the time is required. There's actual um, motor vehicle safety standards that govern all these trucking companies with DOT numbers and commercial vehicles. They're required to train and vet these drivers. So the number one reason that we see here at Shannon Law Group for truck crashes is failure to properly train the truck driver. We've had a number of cases here where the, the accident happens in the first month of the driver uh, driving the big vehicle. They don't understand how uh, this vehicle operates. They don't un understand the power of the vehicle. They don't understand what happens in a critical situation, like they miss a turn and you turn around. They don't understand how uh, much length they should give to the vehicle in front of them for stopping distance. They don't understand all the judgment that's involved. In fact, we have a number of cases where the truck should never have been driven by the driver at all. You see, every driver that um, drives a commercial motor vehicle has to have some sort of licensure to do that. We've had a number of cases in which the driver who caused the crash did not have the proper licensure or training to get behind the wheel of that vehicle and drive. We've had a number of cases in which the weather conditions were horrific. They couldn't see, it was um, too foggy, uh, it was a torrential rainstorm, uh, and the driver could not see, their, um, their vision was not uh, proper to drive this huge vehicle. Uh, they, they, didn't ha they couldn't have this proper stopping distance because of how wet it was. There was snow or ice all over the roadway. They shouldn't have been driving that commercial vehicle, but they did so anyway. And tragedy results. So what are some of the reasons why some of these crashes happen? Number one, failure to properly train the driver. That's basic. 
They're required to have all the sort of, all that training in their personnel file. And we check everything in the personnel file to make sure that this was done properly. What's another part of it? Failure to properly vet the driver. That is, do a proper background check of the driver to make sure that this driver, A, does, has done everything they say on their resume or application. Do they have a bad driving record? Is their uh, driving record like a, um, uh, a receipt from the grocery store that's this long and it's got violation after violation after violation? It's a driver that doesn't know how, not how to drive and fails, fails to um, change the way they drive because it's important. The reason why it's important for a truck driver to be actually properly trained properly vetted is because what we're dealing with is a multi-ton vehicle that can wreak havoc on people on the roadway, including you and me. So those people need to be properly trained. They need to go through a rigorous training program. Now, what's another reason? The other reason is when these trucking companies retain drivers who repeatedly violate all of the regulations We've had a number of cases in which uh, drivers have been um, repeatedly uh, cited for texting, for um, excessive speeding, 10, 20, 30 miles over the limit, uh, failure to stop, um, distracted driving. Um, and there's protocols at, at a lot of these companies that if there is a number of violations, that they need to be retrained so they don't do this again and again and again. Failure to, to uh, vet these drivers, train them, and also failure to dismiss them, the, the, one, the reckless ones. We've seen that over and over again too. So these are some of the reasons why these truck accidents happen beyond the, the basic ones, following too closely, excessive speeding, failure to yield the right of way, um, driving in improper conditions, um, texting while driving, actually watching a movie while driving. All of these things happen in the real world. The reason why someone hires a lawyer in these types of cases is because you will never ever get those documents without the court system, ever. The court system is used as a device to require the defendant and their insurance company to produce documents to you that you would never ever retrieve on your own. The moment that we are hired, we send a letter to the other side requesting and requiring that they retain all of these things that need to be in the file. The trucker's personnel file, their training file, all of the, the specific uh, information with respect to the specific load that they were on, any other entity that was involved in the crash. One of the things that's very important is that uh, in telling the story of how this happened, you need to be able to tell a truthful, full story about how this crash occurred. We, have, we had a number of cases in which we needed to follow the money to determine who was actually controlling the load at issue. We had a, a rather significant case some time ago in which we were told that the full amount of insurance for this huge crash, which killed um, two people and seriously injured another fella, was that there was a total of $1 million available and they had to be split between all of the folks. Well, we went deeper in that case and we found out the company that was actually controlling the load from the beginning to the end. That company was responsible for controlling the driver. That company was responsible for controlling the load. That company made sure that that load got from point A to point B and we brought them in and held them responsible because they were the ones that controlled whether this driver decided to drive while, while uh, very fatigued. In fact, in the case we determined that that driver had actually what they call fixed their books, made fictional uh, um, markings in their book to say that they've been driving only for eight hours when in fact they were driving for hours on end to get across the country. Nowadays, what's happening is that there's what they call electronic uh, log books. So um, truck drivers have to keep log books that are electronic as opposed to paper log books. So we're seeing a more sophisticated discovery system for you and your family to get a copy of an actual 
electronic copy of exactly where that driver was from point A to point B. Other things that we need to look at in a trucking crash in order to do the proper investigation is typically we're finding out that a lot of these larger trucking companies will have electronic devices on the actual vehicle to determine how fast that truck was going at the time of impact and also before impact. Also, what the, um, uh, the amount of time that they took to stop, um, when they applied their brakes, um, if their um, airbags deployed. Um, a number of cases we have now where the truck driver uh, will have a GoPro or some sort of camera that will show their dash view during the crash. We had a case recently in which um, the truck driver had basically testified that our, our um, a client who was a pedestrian had crossed against a light and jaywalked when in fact the GoPro showed specifically that um, our client was walking with the light or in a crosswalk and walked specifically in front of the vehicle and the vehicle rammed into him. If without the GoPro, the people, the, um, the truck driver's testimony may have taken the day, but it's that type of investigation that you need in your case to determine what exactly happened. Who can be held liable in a truck crash? There's obvious ones. First of all, the company that employed the truck driver is responsible for the actions of the truck driver. So that company uh, will be held liable. The driver of the vehicle, obviously, was the one that was actually driving the vehicle and they can be held liable. Another search must be determined to see whose Department of Transportation number is on the side of the truck. Who owned the truck? Who is the one that set the, um, the load in motion? Was there anybody else, any entity controlling the driver or the load during that uh, transportation? We want to make sure that we determine all those things to find out who exactly should pay for any liability as a result of this truck crash. For example, we have had a number of cases in which it wasn't immediately recognizable who was the, the liable other than the driver and the trucking company. We had to look at the Department of Transportation number, the DOT number, we had to look at the, what they call the bill of lading, which for every load, there should be a bill of lading to determine who the shipper is and who the receiver is. Also, in some cases, a logistics broker can be liable for controlling the load from point A to point B, either by failure to vet the trucking company or for asserting um, excessive control over the driver or the company. So that's what needs to be determined as to who can be liable in a crash. One of the main reasons, if not the only reason that you file a uh, lawsuit against a trucking company um, in a crash is so that you are put back in the same position as you were prior to the crash. Now, can that be done? No. So in the American system, money damages are awarded to that person to put them as close as they can to where they were prior to the crash. Now, if you lost an arm or you lost a leg, can we go get an arm or a leg and put that on? No, we cannot. So a jury of your peers will determine how much money is um, reasonable for you to be compensated for the recklessness or uh, negligence of um, the trucking company in your case. Let's talk about the damages that can be awarded. There's things called economic damages in Illinois. Economic damages are basically damages that will go to other people. Say, for example, you had a bunch of medical bills that you incurred as a result of being in the hospital for a lengthy amount of time, for surgeries that you had to have, for the future care. That money is money that will actually be paid to doctors, hospitals, therapists, all those types of people. Does it go to you? Not really, but you can recover it to pay those people. The next thing you can recover is if you are in the hospital or incapacitated and you can't work, 
you should be uh, entitled to every penny that you would have earned during that time period where you could not work, as well as any future uh, amount of money for your loss of earning capacity. That'll be determined um, by your past earning capacity, as well as typically by an expert who will make that decision as to what type of earning you would have had from that date and for the rest of your life if you have a permanent injury. What type of damage was done to your earning capacity? Again, this is money that you would have earned anyway if you were working. So I don't believe that's the biggest part of any case. Typically, insurance companies will look to those numbers as the value of your case, the economic injury. But in reality, that is money, like for example, the medical numbers, those are going to somebody else. Those aren't going to the person that's actually hurt. That's why it's really important to focus on what we call the non-economic damages. These are damages that juries in America award every single day and have done so for the last 100, 200 years um, in America. Uh, it, it goes back almost 1,000 years uh, for the jury system uh, in England. Uh, but in America, this has been going on ever since. Uh, it's a constitutional right to have a jury trial in a civil case. Um, in those cases, the non-economic damages, let's talk about those. Non-economic damages include a number of things, including pain and suffering. Let's talk about pain. Most of the clients that we represent have permanent disabling injuries. They are in pain 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of their life. That is a staggering type of reality. How much is it worth for somebody to be put in pain for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It's worth a lot. That's why typically we wanna make sure that we're able to uh, express exactly how this crash has affected you and your family. It's important because these are the issues, the suffering, the mental suffering. How much is it worth to be able to take a walk with your wife, your husband, your children, to be able to play in the park with them, to swim with them, to be able to go to baseball games, to be able to play basketball with them, to be able to run, to do any type of activity, to sit in a car for more than an hour. That's the type of pain and suffering that we're talking about here. How much is it worth when somebody cannot sleep more than two hours a night because of the excessive pain? We have clients that cannot sleep more than two hours at a time. They have to go sleep in a chair. They can't sleep in their bed anymore. They're in awkward positions. They have to have surgeries over and over again. How much is that pain and suffering worth? In my opinion, it's worth a lot. And a lot should be awarded in these types of situations. It's not really an award. It's a compensation for the negligence or reckless or intentional conduct of another. And your lawyer needs to be aggressive in asking a jury for that type of compensation because the insurance company will not give it freely. They care about the economic numbers. The economic numbers do not tell the story. The non-economic numbers tell the story. 24 hours a day, seven days a week in pain. Say that you're a 20 year old, you get a bad crash. You've got another 65, 70 year life expectancy. That should be worth a lot of money for putting, being put in that type of pain. What's the next ones? There's pain and suffering. The next one is loss of a normal life or disability. So loss of a normal life. What's your normal life? What was your normal life beforehand? Now in my life, I've been blessed. I have a wife. I have six kids. I've coached all my kids throughout their whole grade school career. I've played basketball with them. I've played soccer with them. I've run cross country. I've run with them. I've done all sorts of different sports with them. I've swam with them. I've lifted them up. I've driven them across the country. I've driven them back. I've been able to interact with them in a normal fashion over and over and over again. What is that worth? It's worth a lot. And that's why you have a lawyer to help you put your case on in order to explain that type of thing to a jury. Loss of a normal life for 60 years 
and we break it down into the 365 days of that year. How do we do it? Well, we use a lot of visual techniques because a jury wants to know the truth. They want to know what your life was like beforehand. They know what your future. They want to know what your future is like. They want to know exactly how to compensate you properly. And you need to be able to explain that to a jury. And that's why we really involve our clients in explaining to us how this has affected them. We make sure that we're able to explain that to a jury through their testimony, through testimony of other witnesses, but also through um, videos and through photography. So those are, those are two of the ways. What's the other one? There's another uh, line item if you are disfigured. What is disfigurement? Well, disfigurement can be a number of scars on your body. It can be a noticeable limp. It can be um, any sort of disfigurement of your body that uh, is something that wasn't there before and is there afterwards. And if it's a permanent disfigurement, again, compensation is required from that jury. So in sum, for non-economic damages, which I believe is the proper award in these types of cases. Pain and suffering, past and future. Loss of a normal life, past and future. Disfigurement, past and future. Let's talk about another uh, type of damages, punitive damages. Now, punitive damages are rarely awarded at law. They are reserved for the cases in which uh, the court deems that this defendant should be punished for their conduct. And in fact, punished to deter others from engaging in that type of conduct in the future. So what, is, what are punitive damages? Well, the US Supreme Court has made a determination that punitive damages are constitutional, but they're limited to a number typically um, 10 times of the amount that was awarded. So next question is, when should I hire a truck accident attorney? The moment a major truck accident happens, the insurance company for the trucking company is alerted and they have folks on site within 24 hours. What is the job of those folks? Number one, get statements of people that are gonna be favorable to them. Number two, photograph the scene, videotape the evidence, Make sure that all the evidence is put together and counsel the driver on what and what to say and what not to say. Who's representing you in this equation? Well, the police are investigating it for sure or more than likely, but they're not on your side. The police are there to investigate exactly what happened. You do not have an advocate for you after that truck crash until you hire a lawyer to be on your side. The time to get that lawyer engaged is right away to make sure that your interests are protected. Now, let me answer your first question that you always people always have. How much does it cost to hire a truck accident lawyer? Well, we typically represent people on a contingency fee basis. That means that we were, are only paid if we prevail for you. And we re recover a percentage of whatever you recover. So if we don't win, we don't get paid. Typically, we will um, front the costs in your case, and that'll all be in a written fee agreement, and you will pay us back for those costs as well as the percentage of the uh, recovery. A question that's frequently asked of us is, how long does a truck accident case take to resolve? That depends on a number of factors, but typically, we'll wanna get the court system involved right away to make sure that the evidence is preserved, to make sure that you can um, recover any type of documents that are in the trucking company's files and to make sure that a judge is, is supervising that rather than some sort of insurance company. Now, that'll take time, but it's better to get in line early in the um, court system so that the court system can play out. It depends on what county you file in. Some counties um, have longer waiting times than other, uh, other um, counties, but it all depends. The thing we do know is the sooner that you file, the sooner you'll get to court. So engaging in a letter writing campaign to resolve your case over a one or two year period does not help you get that case resolved sooner. Rather, it's important 
to get the um, judicial resolution system involved right away. We wrote a book called Avoiding a Trucking Nightmare to answer all your questions with respect to um, a trucking crash, what goes into filing a case, resolving it. If you want a copy of this book, Avoiding a Trucking Nightmare, text us at 312-847-2428. That's 312-847-2428. And text the word trucking nightmare and we'll send you a free copy of this. It's also available on our website for, for download at channelagroup.com.